The second year of the smart tenure nears close. Women's basketball catches the Texas sports bug and baseball loses in heartbreaking fashion. This is College Press Box. Now, folks, don't let that depressing pre-show tease scare you away because we've got a great show tonight. Welcome back to College Press Box. I'm Katarina Biancardi, and let's get right into it. So this Saturday, Texas men's basketball fell short to Baylor, 75-64, to marking their 21st loss of the season. Nick Walters reveals what this defeat means for the program. In a season of perpetual disappointment, it was only fitting that the Texas Longhorns come up short in their finale. The 11th ranked Baylor Bears spoil senior day at the drum, taking down the horn 75 64. Games like today, we uh, failed to go out and, and execute exactly what we needed to do uh, as a unit uh, and make enough winning plays. It's a different game and the same exact story for Texas. Despite trailing by only six in the second half, the Longhorns crumbled down the stretch, creating a microcosm for their disastrous 10 and 21 season. Now, if you're talking about being comfortable with the result, with the results we've had, I mean that's that's obviously I'm, I'm not uh, I'm highly uncomfortable with that, and it's been a really you know I think challenging year for everyone in our program from that standpoint. Coach Smart has stressed time and time again the lack of consistent drive in this maturing Longhorn team. Unfortunately for Texas fans, the motivation of the senior sendoff wouldn't cut it for the Horns. There's motivation all around you if you look for it and, and if you choose to grab it. Um, you know, today that motivation uh, I felt was our seniors. I, that, I felt that's what it needed to be. Um, uh, but obviously it, w it wasn't strong enough. This loss is a sour cherry on top of a season stained by 21 losses, marking the worst season suffered by the Horns in 33 years. The season's twists and turns, roaring comebacks and underwhelming letdowns, all encapsulated in today's 75-64 loss to Baylor. From the Irwin Center, Nick Walters, College Press Box. Now we welcome in our basketball es expert, my friend here, Steve Helwick. Steve, always a pleasure to have you on, buddy. Now, we're going to go right into it. Let's get straight to the point. Does this Texas men's basketball team have any shot at this Big 12 tournament? They do have a shot at that first game. That first game against Texas Tech, that's a winnable game. They split the season series with them mm -hmm. at 1-1, one to -one, winning one in the Irwin Center, losing in Lubbock by double digits. But for Texas to win this game in their first game away from the Frank Irwin Center, they're going to have to shoot threes, play mm -hmm. great defense, and win that rebounding battle with Allen and Claire in the post. I think they can win this one. Mm -hmm. I'd give the chances a little less than 50%, but it's definitely manageable. But then they'd have to play West Virginia as a two seed in the Big 12, and asking them to win two games in the tournament is an awful lot for them. I don't see them advancing further than that. And Texas is last place in the Big 12, actually the last power conference team to win, last place team in a power conference to win a conference tournament was 2008 with Georgia winning the SEC. So the chances, history has not shown Texas would have great chances of winning this, which would eliminate them from the tournament contention. And you know, Steve, you're the one with all the facts, and I can always count on you to know the encyclopedia of uh, Texas sports and facts in general. And I do have to say, though, that the positivity is still among this team. You know, Jared Allen said in the post-game um, post press conference against Baylor that, you know, anything can happen, miracles can happen, and they may have to take some miracle games. So now, switching on to the future of Texas basketball, um, there's a lot of things that are up in the air, a lot of mysteries that we don't know about. Talk of Jared Allen and Andrew Jones putting their names in the NBA draft. And after a season without a true point guard, Texas is super excited about hopeful recruit Matt Coleman coming to the 40 Acres next year. So what do you foresee as the fate of the Shaka Smart program? So with Jared Allen's draft stock rising with all these dunks and blocks and just playing his play
level of play just increasing. Mm -hmm. I do not envision him staying. But Andrew Jones is another case. Andrew Jones is a great, talented player, but his game still needs a little more development. He needs uh, that guard who can drive and shoot, just like Baylor's guards did this weekend. And if Andrew Jones can add that dimension to his game, that would help Texas, mm -hmm. and it would help Jones' NBA future. He won't have to go play in the D League and overseas mm -hmm. to start his career. He could just fit right into the NBA. And Texas needs more depth. They need more players like Jones who can drive and shoot. But also with losing Allen and Shaq Clare who's graduating, you're also going to need that big man, someone who can rebound, mm -hmm. somebody who can play in the post, isn't afraid to be physical. And Texas, that's an awful lot of players to ask for for Texas. But Shaka Smart's done such a great job coaching throughout his career, VCU. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he could make it happen, but it's a lot to ask for with given what Texas could lose with Jared Allen if they're already last place in the Big 12. Mm -hmm. You know, Smart's year at VCU is a lot different than uh, his year at Texas. At VCU, he went to the Final Four. This year, not so much. But we'll definitely see how, if you know, Allen leaving, if Jones leaving, and Matt Coleman coming in really changes or breaks down this program. But now we're going to switch to a different side of basketball, Texas women's basketball. we got a big update here for you guys, Big 12 tournament update. So. After defeating Oklahoma State in the quarterfinals, 71 to 60, the Horns fell short to who do you think it was? West Virginia. West Virginia in the semifinals. So now Texas is going to wait its NCAA tournament fate next Monday, where they'll be revealed the um, sign, um, selection send, uh, selection Monday for women's basketball. What do you see um, as they have to prepare for this tournament? The selection committee is probably going to hand Texas a three or four seed. And mm -hmm. Texas a couple weeks ago was a two seed, almost at a one seed with that 19 game win streak. They've fallen off a bit, dropping four mm -hmm. out of their last six. But something positive for the Longhorns is every single one of those games has been close. Mm -hmm. Those four losses are a combined 11 points. So they've been in every game. They just need to work on finishing their games. And they need more scoring from Brooke McCarty. They need Joyner Holmes to return to the double-double machine she was during that long win streak. And if Texas can do that, they could probably make it to the Elite Eight. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of women's basketball tournaments have been chalk lately with uh, top seeds advancing mm -hmm. far. But I, since they've beaten Florida State and Baylor, they could advance past that two seed or the first higher seed they play, as long as it's not UConn. Yeah. <laughs> and then I could see the team reaching the Elite Eight. If they continue this mm -hmm. slump, Sweet 16 might be this team ceiling. But who knows? Last year in the women's tournament, we saw a one, a two, a four, and a seven seed. Yep. So the final four is not out of the question for Texas, and mm -hmm. I, I could definitely see the Longhorns making it that far. Absolutely. Like you said, Steve, only person, only team that it could get in the way of that is UConn because they have demonstrated their talent against Florida State, Baylor, and competition inside and outside of the Big 12. So we'll definitely wait to see how that goes. Um, but Steve, thanks so much for your analysis and your expertise. I can always count on it. Um, and when we come back, we will take you to the softball and baseball time in, uh, diamond. Keep it real, keep it here. This is College Press Box. And folks, welcome back to College Press Box. I welcome in tonight my girl, Jessica Robinson. Jessica, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing incredible. Thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> As always. So we're going to get right into some Texas sports pass uh, basketball and football. So let's get right into men's tennis. So Texas men hosted Wake Forest and Rice this past weekend. Wake Forest opened the match Saturday, defeating UT senior George Goldhoff and sophomore Leo Tellez by 6-3. Wake Forest ended up winning 4-0, but Sunday was a different story. Against Rice, all three doubles lines won with an impressive 6-4 defeat from the Danish boy Christian Siskard and Austin native Colin Marks. The Horns swept singles as well with wins from, with wins from Christian Siskard, George Goldhoff, Leo Tellez, Rodrigo Banzer, and Julian, Julian Zublinski. Texas beat Rice 6-1. And moving over to women's tennis, it was an easy Sunday afternoon for Texas as they won all nine doubles and single matches against Fresno State to win 7-0. Texas swept the three double matches with sophomore Daniela Rowland and freshman Petra Granick winning by 7-5 count. Texas resumes dual match play on March 13th when, it hosts, when they host Rice at Whitaker Tennis Courts. 
Talking men's golf, the Longhorns headed out of the wild Austin weather and into Los Cabos, Mexico for the Carencia Cabo Collegiate last week. Sophomore Steven Cervoni was winning, leading the tournament with career low rounds of 66 and 68 until his third round resulted in a 73 to finish four under par. Cervoni ended up tying teammate Doug Gim for 13th overall. The Longhorns will be back at the Lambkin San Diego Classic next Monday and Tuesday, but keep your eye on the sophomore Steven Cervoni. He is the favorite to win that Classic. Man, I want to be traveling to where all these uh, sports are going because they sound like lots of fun. But now going over to women's golf, senior Haley Meals fired a, uh, at two under 70 shot to lead nationally ranked Texas women's golf in a dual match Sunday against Texas Tech. She had the lowest, the second lowest score of the day just behind Texas Tech's Mami Yama, Yamamoto who shot a 76. The Longhorns fell to the, Ra the Red Raiders, but will return to action March 14th and 15th against the Avenue, um, at the Avenue Spring Break Classic. Now the sport all of you are wondering about, let's talk women's rowing. The Texas women's rowing novice boats had their first season debut this past Saturday at the heart of Texas Regatta on Lady Bird Lake here in Austin. Texas swept the competition and took home first, second, and third place in the open eight category and first and second place in the novice eight categories. Texas hosts the Longhorn Invite March 25th. Be sure to come out for that. And Jessica's being quite humble because she was actually a part of that squad. So congratulations, Jessica. Um, this week, the women's swimming team announced they will be taking, uh, the Horns will be sending 10 individuals and f all five relay teams to compete for the national championships. The NCAA championships will be held in Indianapolis, Indiana in just two weeks. And after clinching the Big 12 Conference Championship, women's head coach Carol Capitoni says, in preparation for NCAAs, her, team, um, her team's Big 12 performance taught the Horns a valuable lesson. They learned that they're tougher than they think they are. You know, they, um, I didn't expect some of these school records to go down. I didn't expect some of the meet records to go down. Um, you know, some of our kids that are, you know, who's, who's the biggest meets in three weeks, we didn't, we didn't give them much rest, and so we expect her to be good, but I didn't expect her to be this good. So I, I think that's just testament to who they are and how tough they are, and they wanted to do it for Texas. It's a great environment. Now back to softball. Women's softball traveled to sunny Arizona this past weekend where they led early against the Arizona Wildcats, but the number six team came out victorious. The Horns shut out the opener 3-0, to zero, but then took two losses, one 2-1 two to one, and another 4-2. to two. A two-run first inning home run by senior McKenzie Krepp in strong innings of pitching from Brooke Bollinger was not enough to push the Horns to victory in their last game push to win. Now we're going to be switching to another diamond, aren't we, Jessica? Um, Texas baseball. So, Texas baseball traveled all the way to California where they fell short in their four-game series to nationally ranked Stanford this past weekend. In game one, seven scoreless innings from Nolan Kingham combined with a pair from Bo Ridgeway led the Horns to their first shot out of the season, a 4-0 win. But the rest of Texas' time in Palo Alto did not fare so nicely. In game two, despite leading the first four innings, Stanford rallied a 3-2 a th a victory. Sunday featured a back-to-back -back header. In game three, Texas led um, Texas led a turn. Uh, Texas's lead turned into a cardinal walk-off. And in the final game of the series, in spite of a complete game, a f uh, complete eight game inning effort from Blair Henley, the Horns dropped the series finale two to one. So a little bit of a disappointing uh, performance by Texas baseball, Jessica. But we're going to actually welcome in Tyler King. Tyler King. Um, is our baseball analyst for tonight, and we welcome him into the studio. Tyler, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, girls. How are y'all doing? Wonderful. Yeah, we, we're, we're doing, doing wonderful. Great. And we have <laughs> Texas side baseball talk ahead of us. So, uh, Tyler, uh, we're going to start off by, despite the series loss against Stanford, um, we want to know what are the positive takeaways you can see from this series? Well, the positive takeaways definitely is the starting pitching. All four games, the starters were phenomenal. Uh, you talked about Nolan's performance on uh, Thursday night. Morgan Cooper had the shortest outing of the four uh, over the weekend, going only six innings on Friday night. Then you had Kyle Johnston going eight innings, or actually eight plus. He went into the ninth inning, uh, gave up two runs. And then Blair Henley uh, getting the eight-inning shutout on Sunday. Uh, Texas could have used a little bit more from them because the bullpen didn't do too well. Um, blowing the uh, game on Friday night with the walk-off, uh, single 
and then the first game of the doubleheader on Saturday with the walk-off three-run bomb. So bullpen has a lot of work to do, um, but the, mm -mm. the starting pitching has been really good. So you talk Henley, you talk Johnson, but speaking of Sh Chase Shugart, what changes do you think Texas can make to fix those bullpen issues you've been talking about? Well, that's a, you, you bring up a good point. Chase has had a, he has an ERA of over 17. Um, he's had five outings. He's only gone three in a third innings, and he's given up seven runs. Um, so he's supposed to be the closer, or as Coach Pierce calls it, the stopper, because um, he doesn't always use him in the ninth inning. He uses him whenever he needs to. Um, I think Texas might have to move Nolan Kingham into the bullpen just because he did well uh, in the first weekend of the season when Rice came to town, and he came out of the bullpen to relieve Morgan Cooper. Even though they didn't win the game, he gave up a couple cheap base hits, and they scored a run. He's the, only, he's the one I think they're going to have to move to the bullpen because we've seen a lot of promise out of Morgan Cooper, Kyle Johnson, and Blair Henley that I think they've secured their spots in the rotation enough to be able to be comfortable with putting Kingham in the bullpen to help secure that end of the staff, especially going into conference play in a couple weeks. Yeah, Tyler, speaking of conference play, um, before we can even get into that, Texas sits with a 7-6 and six record, and later this week, the Horns take on Richmond, Texas A&M, Corpus Christi, and face a weekend series against UCLA. So with these three opponents ahead, what does this young Texas team need to work on over the next week before they head into conference play? Well, the biggest thing, especially with the offense, is they're going to need consistency. Uh, they're not hitting right now. They're hitting the low 200s. They're averaging almost nine strikeouts a game at the plate, and they've only played 13 games. Um, Patrick Mathis was expected to be one of the big bats in the lineup, and right now he couldn't, he couldn't hit water if he, was on, if he fell off a boat. I mean, the guy <laughs> can't do anything right now. He's looking at too many, he's being too picky, and he's looking at a lot of third strikes. He's not getting the pitches he wants, and he's chasing too much. Um, outside of him, Casey Clemens has been really good. Um, but the entire offense as a whole needs to be more consistent because they've had really good games. They've also had a lot of duds, and we saw a couple of those over the weekend not being able to score a lot. I and mean, then the bullpen, um, just, see, and just see how much we can, they can get out of the bullpen, uh, and especially the opportunity for younger guys that haven't gotten the opportunity yet. Five games in a week, that's a lot. So we'll, they're going to have to stretch the staff and the bullpen a lot to be able to get through those five games and not have to overuse guys, especially with – those five games, and then you get rival A&M coming in not too long after that. So uh, they got to pick and choose how they want to use guys uh, in these next five games. Absolutely. A long week ahead for Texas baseball, and I definitely agree with some of your points, Tyler. Consistency needs to be something this team needs to see, and we just want to thank you for your analysis as always. You were definitely our favorite baseball expert. Thanks, Kat. And Jay Rob, always a pleasure on talking with you about the other sports around the 40 acres and Texas baseball. Pleasure to be with you talking any sport, Katarina. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, up next, we have a new installment of Unhooked. Stay tuned. Welcome back inside TSTV Studios. Up next on College Press Box is Unhooked, your weekly dose of sports off the 40 acres. I'm Nick Walters, joined by Mackenzie Palmer. Coming up, we'll show you a pair of jaw-dropping buzzer beaters. Which one is better? We'll leave you to decide. Alrighty, starting off the week, it's championship week. NCAA AP rankings were released today, and the top four teams were no surprise. Kansas is still remains at number one, with Villanova at number two and UCLA at number three. All three teams head in the conference with a 28-3 regular season score record. Gonzaga sits at number four with a record of 30-1. to one. But I would say AAC is a league to keep an eye on this week, specifically the Bearcats in the Mustangs. If these two teams meet in the ACC tournament title game on Sunday, which seems very likely to happen, it will be a must-see for television. Mm. Well, going from the ACC to the Big 12, I think Kansas certainly deserves our attention as they're entering championship week on an eight-game tear with their eyes set on the big dance. Next up on Unhooked, sheer speed. With the NFL Combine in full swing this past weekend, all eyes were glued on the 40-yard dash. For nine years, running back Chris Johnson has had a tight grasp on the record, recording a 4 2 4 in 2006. But on Saturday, Washington wideout John Ross put his name in the history books. 
All right, John Ross is off. He's got the forward leaning motion. He's got the arm swing and everything. He's off and they got to clock him in. It's in at 4-2-2 speed. Wow, can you believe that? All the coaches and all the scouts ooing and aahing, and certainly John Ross's, John Ross's, excuse me, his draft stock just got a big boost. So the unthinkable is now reality. Chris Johnson dethroned as 40-yard dash champ. Watch out, though. I may give Ross a run for his money in the 2020 NFL oh. Combine. Oh, really? You? <laughs> we'll see about that. All righty. Well, speaking of unbelievable, this past week saw a pair of insane moments in the NBA. Two buzzer beaters for the ages. Only one can be crowned as the craziest. Alrighty, we start off in Portland where the Blazers try to salvage a bucket before halftime. Taj Gibson chucks a ball for a third, three to four, uh, a three-fourths court buzzer. Wow. Oh my gosh. Okay, well... Oh, that's a long shot. I mean, that's like 61 feet, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, well, if that wasn't enough already, the NBA gave us yet another buzzer beater. We go to Phoenix for a dire mistake by the Suns and pure heroics by the Celtics. All right, and on the pass in, we got Isaiah Thomas fumbling the ball, Tyre Eunuch, and Bullseye! Winner, 66 69 is the, is the final score for the Suns. Fans don't know what just happened. The, the players are, have no, can't, they can't believe their own eyes, and that's game. So call me a monkey because these shots are making me go bananas. But <laughs> McKenzie, which buzzer beater takes home the prize as the most bonkers? All righty. We see a lot of winning shots all of the time, but you know what's rare. Seeing a 61-foot shot, I think Gibson uh, takes the win for this one. That shot was crazy. Yeah, I wouldn't argue with you. Well, buzzer beaters aside, the NBA season is kicking into high gear. With only 40 days remaining until playoff basketball tips off, what should fans be looking for, McKenzie? I think it may be too early. I think that um, the... I think that the... Um, Don't say I think that the, um, the fans should be looking at um, the Golden State Warriors. We have Durant, who is out with an injury this uh, already, or just started for this season. So I think that um, fans are going to be looking to see how well they can pull off um, their, a win. That's definitely a good thing to look for. Steph Curry shooting worse than his own brother on the Mavericks, Seth Curry, right now. So it may be early, but I need a bold prediction, Mackenzie. What team will hoist the Larry O'Brien Trophy in June? Yeah, it's definitely too, answer to get, too early to give a direct answer, but I would like to see it go to the Golden State Warriors, even though, yes, um, they have been losing as of late, but they are still a cons consistently a good team, and I think that this is their year to win. Mm, yeah, I would have to agree. Well, uh, I think it's going to be some, something to look for after dropping 3-1, three, uh, three to one. Uh, um, lead uh, last in the last finals, so that's definitely, definitely something to look for. So it's good. When College Press Box returns, Katarina closes with what is to look forward in the coming week in Longhorn Sports. Stick around, and we'll be right back. Wow. I For a final time tonight, we welcome you back to College Press Box. Let's take a look what's going around the 40 acres later this week. On Monday through Wednesday, swimming and diving will compete at the NCAA Zone D Diving Meet. Tuesday, baseball faces Richmond home, and you can catch that on Longhorn Network. Wednesday, softball versus UTSA. You can also find that on Longhorn Network. And then you can stay on Longhorn Network to see baseball face Texas A&M Corpus Christi. But at 8.30, you got to switch your channel to ESPNU for the men's basketball game versus Texas Tech at the Big 12 tournament. And Friday, um, you will find baseball versus UCLA on LHN. You can find them all weekend there. And then track and field er, competes at the NCAA Indoor Championships, and we wish them the best of luck there. Uh, softball is on Sunday at UCLA. And so now we are going to shift focus to a little bit something different before we go. 
So last spring, baseball fell under 500 for the first time in over a decade. And so far, this football season and basketball season had tough losing seasons. The struggles of the major Texas sports is well documented. So our very own James Grachos went out to the mall to see how it's affecting the students. So we're here live looking at all the students in absolute protest <laughs> over Texas sports. I can't believe what I'm seeing right now. They're putting up flashcards to see who should be the next head coach of Texas football. Tom Herman, your job might be in jeopardy. Head coach of football, basketball, and baseball. Uh, head coach of football, Tom Herman, for next year. Uh, Shaka Smart for basketball. You don't know baseball, do you? I don't know baseball. Uh, basketball coach is Shaka Smart, and the football coach is Tom Herman. Uh, but I have no idea what the baseball coach is. Um, Tom Herman's the head football coach. Shaka Smart's the head basketball coach. Not much of a baseball guy, so I don't know the baseball. Seems to be a common theme right now. When was the last time either of you watched a Texas sporting event? Is Augie the same master still around? No, unfortunately, Augie's gone. I like walking by the TV, does that count? Because yes. I do that. Okay. Well, okay, then yes. No. Which president was in office the last time all three Texas Longhorn teams were under 500? Wow. Okay. I don't know. I'll ballpark uh, Truman. I would say uh, Truman. Bill no Clinton? <laughs> no, my president's no more my sports. <laughs> this is the answer. Ronald Reagan. Not a bad choice. Eisenhower is the choice. Okay. <laughs> the answer. Did you ever feel that Texas sports would fall this slow again? Speechless. Are you feeling positive yourselves? No, not at all. I would like to abstain from commenting as to not get bullied. <laughs> I feel like my positive energy can help bring it back. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I got a heck of a laugh out of my good friend James Grachos. Fantastic work as always, James. But folks, unfortunately, that's all the time we have with us tonight. Make sure to keep with, up with us on social media at TSCV Sports. Our show airs every Monday at 9.30. And don't forget about Wednesdays at 9 when we dive into some sports debate on College Crossfire, hosted by our own very own Reese Miller. We want to thank everyone who's taking part in making this show this semester possible. And I have to give a special shout out to my girl, Alyssa Killebrew, the executive director and producer of this show. Uh, thanks for all you guys who tuned in throughout the year. Until next time, I'm Katarina Biancardi, and have a wonderful night.